Okay. Ooh, I'm pretty loud. Hello, everyone. Aloha. Well, welcome to Austin. Is anybody having fun yet? I, I hope so. I hope so. It, it, there's no point in coming if you're not going to have fun. Like I said, meet a friend. <laughs> Enjoy your time here. Right? S try to meet new people. Um, and hopefully with my presentation today, you'll, you'll have a little fun. Um, try to make my presentations a little lighthearted. Right? People take things too seriously sometimes. So hopefully you can have a laugh or two. I'm not a comedian and I'm not witty, but hoping some of this stuff will resonate with you where you know, you'll, you'll laugh a little bit. Okay, so my name is Mabel Lopez and I am the senior technical staff member for supply chain security at IBM. Um, I lead the enterprise-wide mission for enabling product security, specifically supply chain security. Um, I have a, a couple of colleagues in the audience that also work on this with me, so thank you for supporting. <laughs> And um, I've been in security for about mm, six, seven years now, have master's in cybersecurity. Um, prior to that, I was pretty much IT, uh, starting with virtualization and cloud solutions for IBM and their customers. Um, and that was about mm, 15 some years ago. So, um, so yeah, been in an industry for a while, um, but security is my passion now, so. Okay, so ready to learn about SBOMs? Okay, so this is a quick agenda. Obviously, we need to know why we're doing SPOMs. Why is it so important? Um, and then I'll go over you know, common things, people processing te technologies, right? What hiccups we ran into, um, what are the successes that we've learned, um, and then looking forward, right? Not only from IBM's perspective, but from the community, right? What call to action from the community you know, am I looking for, and I think, oof, and I uh, think the industry in itself is looking for. And if you have questions throughout, please don't wait to the end. I'm pretty bad with memory, so when I have a question, if I don't ask it immediately, I forget. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, stop. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Okay. Okay, so why are we doing this? Anyone, why are we doing SBOMs? Executive order, other reasons. What, what, what was that? Solar winds. Anything else? To launch software. What else? Vulnerability management. That's a pretty good one. So, um, you know, devs hate security, and my slides are kind of acting on their own. Um, one reason is devs hate security. Um, the Linux Foundation research arm actually did a survey and found that only 2% on average of the time spent on security in the open source community is on security. And I love this quote. Um, I find the enterprise of security a soul withering chore. Right, so if devs hate security, don't like security, then how can you trust the open source packages that you are consuming? And somebody mentioned solar winds, right? Solar winds happened, ruined my Christmas vacation and many others. Um, 300,000 customers impacted by this, right? And this really was a catalyst for the White House to say, hey, you know, something has to change. We can't keep up like this. White House executive order, as somebody mentioned, right? Um, this is from the memorandum and it says, developers are responsible for all code, including open source, right? I need to use this pointer, um, including open source. Um, and so people, the developers need to know what they have in their software and produce a software bill of materials. So I know a lot of folks have been saying, you know, this is coming down the pipeline, right? So if you are part of an open source community and you are not providing this, you can expect organizations to start asking for this, right? So you might as well get ahead of it. Another reason is Log4j, right? Vulnerability management was something that, tossed, that got tossed around. Um, but this is just yet another example of 
if things go wrong, it can go really wrong, right? There was millions of attempts made per hour to try to exploit this, right? And this was a yet another, my slides are, are doing something funky. Um, there was uh, uh, another holiday ruined, luckily not mine this time, um, but other people that I know that they had to actually work through the holidays for this particular vulnerability. So now that we have that foundation of the why we're doing SBOMS, why it's so important to do this, um, you know, the VP of product security at IBM, you know, asked me to take this on. And, you know, I said, you know, challenge accepted. So, you know, let, let's make some SBOMS. How, how hard can this be? Um, so, you know, let's think about this. Well, how many products do we have? 1,800 plus? Okay, not too bad. Well, we have SaaS, we have on-prem, we have mobile, we have consulting assets, basically code that's produced for a particular customer. Oh, and, and we have legacy. Okay, well, how do they build their software? Well, this team does something different than this team? Okay, well, where, where does that exist? Who maintains that? Um, and once I gather all this information, where's the product metadata? How do I know about the versions? How do I keep track of the versions, right? Um, and uh, starting to think about the standards, SPDX, CycloneDX, you know, why, why are there more than one specification? Why are there different? And why are there not, this was pre-today, why are there so many, the uh, lack of tools for creating SBOMs, right? To now today, there are so many different tools that claim that they can produce SBOMs. Well, why, right? Um, and then starting to think about, oh, well, we have OEM code in some of our products. Well, how do I get the software bill of materials for that to include into my software bill of materials? So all of these questions just started adding up, adding up, and eventually, this was me, um, probably about late last year, early this year, you know, what, what did I actually get myself into, right? People make S-bombs to be this very simple thing, simple concept, and it's, and it's not. Maybe for smaller organizations, maybe for organizations that don't have 1,800 plethora of products. Um, and, you know, it was quite overwhelming, um, not only for myself, but for some of my teammates. So, um, you know, I started to enlist a volunteer army, right? No one person can do this on their own. So little by little, we started getting an army of folks, developers, opportunity managers, pro product managers, you know, the security folks, lawyers. Oh, 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 sorry, back. Uh, security folks. And what turned from one to five, to 10, to 50 volunteers across five different business units, all virtual. And by the way, I had no relationships with any of these folks, right? So very much like the open source community. It was pretty spectacular that I was able to, you know, try to get people to work together. But after, you know, growing so much, it was hard to do things in an agile way with everyone, right? So started to look at you know, OpenSSF. What are they doing? How are they modeling their working groups and bringing that internally? One of the most successful working groups we have internally is the SBOM working group led by Matt Rakowski. Right? And that really deals with what type of data do we really want to be in our SBOMs? There are additional uh, metadata that you can include that are specific to your products or your company. Right, so that in itself was a chore on its own, um, and to date has been very, very successful working group with that working group alone has 50 plus members, right? Um, obviously not everything worked from the get-go. We had to iterate, 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 and sometimes we had to pivot because leadership said, hey, there's these um, new responsibilities or new priorities that you have to focus on. We need to put things on pause. Um, and so that created kind of a challenge, right? These are volunteers. They have competing priorities. And so as a result, leadership realized the complexity of not only SBOMs, but supply chain security as a whole, right? It can't be a volunteer army. It has to be dedicated group of folks 
focused on this problem. And so now we have a supply chain security org. Um, but even before that, we had to educate, and we continue to educate. And what do I mean by educate? Well, a lot of people don't know what SBOMs are, right? We had to teach the lawyers, you know, here's an SBOM, here's what it looks like. What can we or can't we disclose, right? Those are things that people typically don't think about. Um, there are things that, unfortunately, for a company as large as IBM, you can't just share everything, right? So there's a, a field by one of the specifications that says author. Well, what if the author is an IBMer? That's personal information. We can't release that. So now we have to alter that field to be a more generic field. Maybe it's a division, not a person, right? So working with the lawyers, trying to understand that. Procurement, uh, supply chain uh, or supply risk management team, right? That works with procurement, right? Things that you're buying. Right? Can we change the contracts so that they can provide us an SBOM? How long is it going to take to do that? Right? But you have to educate all of these different types of personas to be able to express the why we need them to buy in and help us on this journey. Any questions? Anyone work in data centers? One person? Oh, come on, ever? Well, anyone tell me what this is? <laughs> yes, it is very much a mess. Um, I actually used to work for System X um, in IBM, and we actually had a lab that looked just like this. It was a play lab, so it wasn't like an actual customer's lab. And th this was a mess, um, and uh, the reason why I bring up this picture is because, you know, I envisioned a supply chain security pipeline, but the reality is it, everything looks like that inside IBM. There's legacy processes, there's new processes, there's different BUs, different teams, right? And so how do we go from here to here, right? In my old lab, I just cut the cables. I literally cut cables and just redid everything, right? Because we could do that. Um, but I can't cut these cables for the BUs and the product teams at IBM. Um, I think uh, I would probably get fired. Um, so, you know, we have to basically untangle these webs little by little. So how do we do that? Um, for supply chain security pipeline, we have to enable policy and governance in the supply chain security pipeline. We don't want devs, architects, release folks to be worried, and my slides are, are going a little haywire. Give me one second. We don't want um, uh, the, devs, the devs or any product teams to be worried about security, right? Going through the memorandum, going through the NIST frameworks, the SSDFs, right? All of those requirements take a lot of time to go through. We don't want developers, we don't want architects having to go through that unless they're security focused. So let's build that into the pipeline so that they can do their day jobs and not have to worry about the constant changing of new requirements, new policies that they have to meet, right? An obvious extension would be CICD as a service, right? So not just supply chain security pipeline, which has a very specific purpose, but why do we have all these different build systems, right? Why not create a service with some customization for all of the teams at IBM to you know, leverage, right? They could still tweak it, but at the very least, the foundation is there. As a developer, do you really want to be messing with your build infrastructure and maintaining it? No, right? You want somebody else to do that for you. And like I mentioned, custom options, right? An inner source catalog for Tecton, uh, Tecton tasks as an example. Um, and legacy and proprietary support. We have a lot of teams that they don't use Go, right? They don't use Java. They use an IBM proprietary language. So how do we support those folks, right? We need to create something custom for them. And they can then plug this in back into the CICD as a service. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
these slides. Um, we also have kind of a consulting arm in supply chain security. So let's say there is a legacy team, right? They don't know how to get started. They don't know how to modernize their environment. They don't know what an SBOM is. They don't even know how to, they don't know anything. So we actually do SBOMs for them, analyze SBOMs for them. Um, we also do, a colleague of mine is in the audience, do open source software security vetting and license vetting, right? We don't want to have, again, the devs doing this. So we provide this as a service. And then continuous compliance. This is actually really key. Just because you've created an SBOM does not mean you're, mean you're done. And the keynote mentioned this earlier. You have to do something with that SBOM. So let's give an example of your code does not change. The SBOM's not gonna change, but what's gonna happen tomorrow? Anyone? There you go, new vulnerability, right? Well, okay, your SBOM didn't change, your code didn't change, but how do you know about that new vulnerability if you're not gonna scan? Right. Typically, these pipelines trigger a, a new scan, a new build to identify those new vulnerabilities. Well, let's leverage the SBOM. Oh, <laughs> sorry. It must be using the timings of my, my practice, is my guess. Um, the, uh, I forgot what I was saying. Mm, thank you. Um, so analyzing the SBOM, instead of using like let's say a pipeline, as, as an example, uh, you can use something off-site, right, that doesn't really use up a lot of resources. Let's analyze the SBOMs for the packages, compare that to NBDB or, you know, some other database um, of your choosing and figure out what vulnerabilities might pop up new, right? Additionally, you could have an uh, uh, IBM team that um, we work with does do this where they have a continuous compliance pipeline that daily builds the code and rescans it, right? So you can't just say, okay, SBOM done. Nope, you're not. Because just because you're done and your code doesn't change does not mean you're not vulnerable the next day. Okay. So, as I said earlier, I'm trying to make it easy for everyone to understand supply chain security right, and SBOMs in general. When I was going through the NIST um, cybersecurity risk management framework, um, which was just the final draft was released in, in May, I could understand it, but visually I could not conceptualize what it was asking me to do. And I'm a very visual person. I need to visually see what I'm being asked of to you know, per perform my, my next task or, or whatnot. So I've created, this is the third iteration of this framework. It literally takes you through the entire supply chain security process end to end based off personas, right? So if you think of, you know, your vendor or supplier coming in, right? They provide you an SBOM. Well, you need to take that into consideration in your design. Well, what are you gonna do with that SBOM? Well, you're probably gonna put it in some sort of pipeline to analyze, right? Um, or some sort of tool that might be down here for continuous compliance. Additionally, you know, upstream open source communities, that code that you're gonna be injecting into your products, right? You need to be able to assess what that risk is of that product or that package, right? And you know, making sure you're doing all the compliance checks, right? A lot of the frameworks deal in this area, development and build. But they don't really go too deep into the other things. Well, sure, but what happens when you have a dust bomb, right? What do you do with that data? Well, should we have a data lake and a data warehouse to house this information and then apply machine learning to identify maybe risks that we as humans are unable to see. That is something that we're working on right now to understand not only vulnerability as a risk, but a legal risk, right? Because regardless if we like it or not, the government tells us you cannot do business with these countries. 
And I know that there is a stance on, well, we don't want to do this as open source, but we as IBM, if we're going to consume open source, we have to understand. Is 50% or more of this code developed outside of the US, and if so, where? So how do you assess a legal risk in addition to vulnerability risk, in addition to people risk, right? There is a Linux hypocrite, right? I think that was a couple years ago, who changed the code, right? Well, what happens if that user is impacting 100% of your products? How do you use this data lake or this warehouse to go back to identify that user, to say, hey, we really now need to look at all of these packages to identify risk that this user now poses to our products, right? So there's a bunch of different things that, that happen in here. I know this text is small, but this, the slides are available in, in, um, online. More than happy to go back with you to the booth, the IBM booth, there's a larger screen. Or I'm on the OpenSSF Slack channel, and you can reach out to me. I'm more than happy to give you this presentation. Right? The idea is, is that this is supposed to be a framework for all, and in my next iteration, I plan to map this to Salsa. Right? So how does Salsa help you achieve this? Right? Any questions on the framework? And thank you, Eva, for blessing me with your presence. <laughs> OK, so technology. Unfortunately, there's no Swiss Army knife. And that is what I think the industry isn't really telling all of us. You can't just do this with one tool. You have to have a toolkit to enable you to do this. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's a ton of SBOM tools, but accuracy depends on when you run those tools and against what, right? So if you think of um, an environment with co-located code, let's say a GitHub repository with co-located code that has dev test. If you run an SBOM against that repository, now you have accuracy issues because that's not necessarily in your product, right? Because you've built it too soon. However, it does do the shift left principle of telling the developers, hey, you have a problem here. You might want to consider fixing it. But it's not a customer issue. So you don't want to give a customer that SBOM because it's not accurate. Well, you want to do this during build, right? Pull in the dependencies and the packages that you truly need for your product but then also analyzing after the fact. So we're actually using a multitude of tools um, to uh, an not only analyze the packages, but validate, right? Did the initial SBOM that was created actually have all packages? And if we think about um, some of our products, the source code repository doesn't have, let's say, an OEM package. That's somewhere else. Right? And so we have to code for these types of situations where we have to pull information about OEM or somewhere or um, you know, a third party uh, per, uh, company that we're working with. Uh, let's say Red Hat as an example. We don't have Red Hat's code, but there is a database elsewhere that says, hey, this product belongs with this product as a bundled package. Well, we need to provide an SBOM to our customers like that. So it's not as easy and straightforward as people make it seem that it's just one tool to rule them all. Yes? Um, for OEM package code, what are you looking for from an SBOM perspective? That it meets specification, whether it be Cyclone TX or SPDX. Um, really, we can request them right now of our OEMs, um, but unless it's in our contracts, they're not obliged to give them to us, right? And so we have to start having those conversations of, we're happy that you maintain your SBOMs. We don't want to maintain them for you, but we need to somehow link to them. Yes, go ahead. More, more of a process. Let's say we have an SBOM uh, for our product, OEM. Mm -hmm. And how do we actually get the data? Is that yeah, the idea would be, and the question was, you know, from a process perspective, what does it look like for, you know, getting an OEM SBOM, if I understood it correctly? It would be automated. We don't want any manual, right? This is just too overwhelming. Some of our product teams release every two weeks. 
we have 1,800 products. So if 1,800 products release every two weeks, there's just no way we're going to keep up with that scale. Right? And so the idea would be that they would tell us, hey, or, or we would tell them, put it in this repository here, and then we would somehow link it. Right? Um, but we're still navigating that of how do we get our OEMs to give us the SBOM? Because some are willing and some are not. Right? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, so the question for the virtual audience is, you know, do, do I think uh, this will drive a common framework or standard for, for, you know, this kind of interaction or relationship? And the keynote mentioned it earlier today, right? Uh, SBOM transport is a, a topic of consideration, and I suspect different folks will handle it differently. Um, and this is something that we've been thinking about in terms of like a trust center, right? If you go to IBM.com, there's like a trust center page. And that talks about all the product um, uh, security details, right? If you want to understand like, you know, our ISO certifications or SOC certifications, you can go and grab that data. Well, why can't we use that for SBOMs, right? Can we use our portal, right, for, for that kind of mechanism and somehow link it? Right, because we know the ordering systems, as an example, have a lot of this linkage. Let's leverage that. But how do we leverage that? And oh, by the way, IBM doesn't use one ordering system. <laughs> they use, I think, three different ones, depending on you know, the product. So that makes it even more complicated. But I do think eventually, as the industry evolves, as the industry starts to adopt SBOMs more and using them, then it will start that discussion of, well, how do we share this more easily where it's not everybody on their own do, you know, architecting this thing and, and implementing it? Um, but I just don't think we're there yet. Okay. Any other questions? Um, let's see. Uh, so, mm, mm, nope, sorry, this, is, this only works as a laser. Um, what I can tell you is uh, from uh, our our work that we're doing, we're obviously using IBM Clouds for our pipeline um, with Red Hat OpenShift. Um, we are using Tecton. We're trying to be conformant to not only SPDX, but for Cyclone DX. Um, GitHub, we use GitHub internally. Um, and we also have open source communities that are maintained by IBM that obviously use GitHub. And then I have the you know, OpenSSF scorecard over there. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we need to analyze different types of risks. It's not just about vulnerability. It's also about the people, right? And so Scorecard gives us that view of the people, that community, and what they are doing from a security best practices. So looking forward. Use a supply chain security framework, right? I'm more than open to suggestions and feedback on can you use this framework and how, right? Can we improve it for you, right? It's not meant to be an IBM only thing. I want people to actually use this to help them in their journey. Um, it takes a community, not only internally in your organizations, but the open source community. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and no one single person or company is an expert. I don't care how much they tell you they are. It, it's, it's a community effort. We can't do this alone. Um, again, no one tool to rule them all. Right? People will promise, hey, yeah, we can make an SBOM. I call that a partial SBOM. It is not a true SBOM unless you've done analysis from different tools. You're using containers? OK. What does, you know, what does a container scanning uh, tool say? Right? You're using open source packages, okay. What does a source code analysis tool say, right? And during runtime, what does it say, right? You need to be able to identify during the different parts of the development life cycle um, whether the SBOM is accurate or not. So it's not just the one and done. Iterate and educate. You need to be able to speak the language of the folks that are gonna be helping you with this. You need to tell the stories from a legal perspective. Why do lawyers care? Why do product managers care? Why does procurement care, right? You have to get the buy-in from the different personas, 
in order to be able to help you on this journey. For IBM, um, we are contributing to a variety of open SSF projects. Uh, I myself am trying very hard <laughs> to contribute more into Salsa. Um, I am new to open source as of last year, so I'm kind of starting to get a little bit more comfortable, and as I get more comfortable, I'm able to contribute a little bit more. Um, but we have long been working on open source at IBM. We have an entire printout with, you know, uh, a little list, and my battery is running out. Oh, look at that. Um, and uh, we are also, again, like I mentioned, trying to improve the consistency and accuracy of our SBOMs as IBM. We're a huge company with 111 years of history and a multitude of products, right, in different technologies and some very, very legacy. And so it's not easy to create a single standard SBOM, you know, not specification, but a process in which you do that. So we are working with a variety of teams to make our SBOMs more accurate. I mentioned earlier the machine learning and AI to assess risk. Again, it's not just about vulnerabilities. You have to assess different type of risk, and unfortunately, IBM Legal is part of that, right? So how do I assess the legal risk of using a package? And how do you bundle that up together to make a recommendation for, let's say, mergers and acquisition or a, a purchase of a product, right? So we need to be able to quickly identify the risk of using some sort of software. So for the community, industry and open source community, get your security people involved. We don't have enough. Oh, I guess they don't like security. That was a nice honk. Um, get your security people involved. I am a security person. I don't do open source as a day-to-day -day job. Right? I, I work under the CISO office. But what we as security people can do is enable the devs who hate security, try to automate the security in their open source community or in their products, right? So try to get 5% of their time, right? I think as security focals, we need to enable the entire industry, the entire community, and do our part in some way. Incentivize devs to take security seriously, gamify it, Right? If they find a bunch of vulnerabilities and fix it, whether it be open source or internal, give them you know, some prize or some money, right? W whatever you're choosing. But we need to be able to get devs to take security seriously. This is in healthcare systems. This is in critical infrastructure. This is in government systems. Right? It's not a game when somebody's health is at risk or you know, when they're bank gets hacked or their credit card gets hacked, right? That's their software. They need to take security a little bit more seriously. And for the love of God, please validate your SBOM against specification. Um, I don't know how many SBOMs I get that when I go run it through a validation tool, I get a ton of errors. I can't do anything with that. That, that makes me spend a lot of cycles trying to figure out what's wrong with it and maybe I, can I tweak it. So before you give an SBOM to someone, at the very least, use the tools that are available in the community to validate those SBOMs. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, enable other personas, right? We can't just be talking to the devs. We have to be talking to other people as well in their language so that they can help us create SBOMs, help us improve supply chain security. Uh, and this is a personal plug, stay tuned. There is a supply chain security paper coming out soon. It's kind of doing its last revision, red edits. Um, myself and others at IBM um, have uh, contributed to it and it's not your typical you know, framework. It's not a, uh, a brand push. It truly is a perspective of supply chain security and what organizations need to know when they're embarking on this journey, including the framework that I showed earlier. And I'm also uh, doing blog series internally and hopefully externally soon based on personas, giving a security checklist for developers, for architects, for lawyers, for consultants, et cetera. Because again, you have to speak their language 
And if, if you can't speak their language, they're, they're just not going to buy in. Um, and there's a ton of IBMers here presenting. Um, I don't know if you saw in the first day's keynote, there's a huge list. So um, check out our other presentations. I know two are in the audience that have uh, presentations Thursday and I think maybe Friday. And this is uh, a, a slide on you know, what we're doing for supply chain security. We're very much heavily invested in OpenSSF and the different uh, working groups. And then stop by the Code Cafe. I actually did the, um, th th this little training the space rover to you know, do stuff. And I was third yesterday. I don't know what place I am in today, but it's a pretty fun game. Um, and there's going to be Voodoo Donuts, and there is Barista Made Coffee. So please stop by. And if, again, if you want to talk to me now or at the IBM booth, by, by all means, you know, c come see me. Any questions? We have a question in the front. So I actually have one virtual question that oh, came virtual. in. Oh, virtual? Okay. Uh, from Don. It says, we've heard a lot about the value of SBOMs, but if we create them, where should they be stored and then externally accessed? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things that... Um, the, the paper tries to address is that kind of uh, that kind of question, right? You do have to think about, you know, where internally are you going to uh, store it? Who's going to access it? And this is kind of covered by the NIST uh, cyber. I think it's a cybersecurity risk management, no cyber supply chain risk management framework, um, or the SSDF. I can't remember which one. And they do talk about centralized storage. They talk about locking it down doing logging, right? And so you have to take that into consideration from an internal perspective. From an external perspective, it depends, right? Do you want to be fully transparent with your customers and you don't care who sees your SBOM? Then you can place it somewhere publicly. Um, but if there are contracts, as an example, that you are bound by that says thou cannot release an SBOM without first notifying us as a you know, big corporation, you might have some constraints there. And so when considering that, you might want to think about, well, can you validate NDAs, as an example? That could be a, a mechanism. Can you somehow link it to your entitlement uh, process, right? A lot of customers are able to go to a website and see what they're entitled to. Maybe you can put the SBOM there. Um, and as mentioned earlier today, there's not really a standard, um, but there are a lot of things that you could potentially leverage that's already existing in your you know, ecosystem when it comes to ordering your products. Um, but it's kind of a, a gray area, and it really would depend. I know there's an, another question up here. Yeah. Um, is this working? It, is that mic on? Okay. Um, so um, how are you... Say, uh, if your customer is asking for an SBOM to you today, mm -hmm. are you only sharing the external dependencies or you're also sharing some of the internal commercial dependencies in your products? And like, what are the challenges that you're facing in that? So currently, it depends on, on the customer and on the request, unfortunately. Um, the supply chain security team right now has a process because we don't have an automated way of pushing those things yet. We're working on it. Um, we actually get the requests, which so far hasn't been a lot, um, and we take a look at the why. Why are they asking this question for an SBOM? Do they even know what to do with an SBOM? And a lot of times, they're not even looking for an SBOM. They're looking right. for, let's say, vulnerability. And I have one more minute left. Um, and so I'm not sure if that helps or, or, or not. And I, can, I'm, I can connect with you. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. connect with me afterwards yeah. since yeah. I'm running out of time. Yeah. And Ava. A little bit, yeah. And, and that is also part of uh, my colleague's presentation because it's not so much about identity. It's about is, quote, unquote, 50% or more of the code being developed in a country that's sanctioned. 
Sure. Doesn't mean that you're a citizen, but is it being developed there? And so that poses a legal risk, unfortunately, to a company like IBM. Yes, yes, correct, correct. And I am being told that my time is up, but I'm more than happy to uh, take uh, questions and, and